grief-stricken family mourns the death of its favourite son, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Their anguish is shared by a disbelieving world, appalled at the brutality of the slaying of the 35th President of the United States. I feel, based upon what I know now, there was what I would call a benign cover-up. Yes, there was. They were concerned about Oswald's connections to the Soviet Union and to Castro. And they were fearful that if the American public were to find this out, they could become so incensed that it could have possibly led to an atomic war. We have the right to know the truth. If we don't have the truth, Everything we build on is a lie. It's like building a building on a false foundation. Sooner or later, it's going to crumble. I think we must know what happened to, in November 22, 1963, in order to be a democracy today. And until the truth is told about that day, then we don't know that they're telling the truth today. Alan Dulles, director of the CIA, until Kennedy fired him, was one of the commissioners responsible for producing the 26-volume Warren Report on the President's assassination. The American media were glowing in their praise of the report that concluded Lee Harvey Oswald was alone responsible. It was only under closer scrutiny that the superficiality of its findings became clear. The Warren Commission decided that there were three shots fired, and the first shot struck the President in the back, exited his throat, went on to strike Governor Connolly in the back, and exited uh, in his right chest and then went through his right wrist and then wound up embedded in his thigh and the bullet fell out at Parkland Hospital. The Warren Commission also decided the second shot probably missed and flew off into Dealey Plaza somewhere. And the Commission decided that the third shot struck the President in the head and killed him. And that's the official version of what happened. And it's interesting, one of the early researchers pointed out that no witness at any time has ever described the assassination as having happened that way. Only the Warren Commission came up with that interpretation, and it's the single assassin theory. On the morning of the assassination, Bill and Gail Newman had gone down to Dealey Plaza with their children to watch the presidential motorcade pass. They were the closest spectators to the tragedy, and their account is echoed by many others who were there. The first two shots, I didn't realize what they were, but the third shot, after it was uh, fired, I heard Mrs. Kennedy scream, oh no, they have shot Jack, and it was just sort of sent a chill over you. It was just terrible. I can remember uh, seeing the side of the president's ear and head come off. Uh, I remember a flash of white and the red and just bits and pieces of uh, flesh exploding from the president's head. At that time, I turned to Gail and said, uh, that's it, hit the ground, and we turned and uh, hit the ground and covered our children. When the third shot was fired, uh, I thought it came from directly behind uh, towards the grassy knoll behind me. Uh, I based that primarily on the uh, third shot uh, from what I saw of the side of the president's head coming off and from the sound of the, uh, the rifle, the report of the rifle. As the official story started coming out and hearing that the shots came from the building, these witnesses started to doubt their own ears. So as the days went by, fewer and fewer of these witnesses would come forward because they just all of a sudden weren't really sure about what they had heard. They were convinced on November 22, 63, that at least one shot came from the front. But by four or five days later, then they weren't sure and they didn't come forward at all. Mary Woodward, 
was a junior reporter on the Dallas Morning News who had joined the lunchtime crowds in Dealey Plaza to watch the Kennedy motorcade. She was the journalist closest to the tragedy and rushed back to her office to file the story in a state of great consternation. They first of all took me to the office nurse and had me have a tranquilizer because I, they thought was somewhat hysterical. I think I was behaving quite rationally under the circumstances. But anyhow, I then sat down and wrote the story immediately and actually had completed the story before the news was absolutely confirmed that he was even dead. So the story was absolutely my own impressions. It was not from anything anyone had said or what I had read or heard. Some things I have often said I would hate to swear before a court of law or before God, but one thing I am totally positive of in my own mind is how many shots there were, and there were three shots. The second two shots were immediate. It was almost as if one were an echo of the other. They came so quickly. The sound of one did not cease until the second shot. With the second and third shots, I did see the president being hit. I literally saw his head explode. So uh, I felt that the shots had come, as I wrote in my article, from behind me and to my right, which would have been in the direction of the grassy knoll and the railroad overpass. Because it contradicted the sole assassin theory, Mary's eyewitness account was quickly pulled and her version discounted. Civic leaders, responsible people, whether it be the mayor, the managing editor of the paper, almost felt it a responsibility to kind of not rock the boat, perhaps. The neat answer was the version that came to be the most widely accepted, that there were three shots and they had all come from the school but depository building and they were all fired by Lee Harvey Oswald. We do know that the FBI, as the official investigative body for the Warren Commission, apparently collected all the possible evidence it could find that indicated Lee Harvey Oswald did it and did it alone. Other evidence that pointed to perhaps other people or other locations for shooters was either ignored or deemed to be mistaken or misinterpreted. I was interviewed by the FBI, but I did not testify before the Warren Commission. Uh, it's my understanding the reason I did not go before the Warren Commission was because in my uh, statement that I thought the shots came from directly behind implied the shots were coming from the grassy knoll. Uh, this is something apparently the Warren Commission did not want to hear. Uh, they wanted to keep the direction of the assassination in the direction of the school book depository. On that tragic day in Dallas, the routine protection of the President of the United States was compromised from the very beginning according to military expert Colonel Fletcher Prouty. What they call protection of the president is an old skill. I went to Mexico City in 1956 when President Eisenhower went to Mexico City. And by that, I mean the security people went there more than a month early to look at every angle of the trip. There are rules and manuals on what we call protection. The Secret Service, that is a organization of limited size, is authorized to call any number of military people. And these are military people who are already trained to augment their forces in a case like this. There's no shortage of people. Ordinarily, a unit of military, I think was called a special group number 113, would have come up from San Antonio, Texas, and would have been deployed all through the streets of Dallas, the important streets of Dallas. That was not done. In fact, the commander was specifically told he wasn't needed. You've all seen the picture of the school book building, you know, where Oswald is supposed to have shot the president. You notice in those pictures there are open windows. If the Secret Service had been there and had done their usual job, none of those windows would have been open. And had anyone opened one of those windows at that time, they would have been on the radio, they would have had a man in that room immediately, and the window would have been closed. You see, that's protection. That didn't take place. In fact, there were no Secret Service people on the ground around Dealey Plaza that afternoon. They were told they were not needed. There was further unprofessional conduct concealed at the time. The night before the assassination, most of the presidential bodyguard spent a drunken evening at this notorious Fort Worth nightclub, some staying until 5 a.m. Drinking alcohol while on a tour of duty contravened all Secret Service regulations. 
could well explain their failure to react when the deadly shots strafed the presidential car only hours later in what was to be a classic ambush. Instead of going straight down the street and then to the trademark, he made this 90 degree turn and then another very sharp turn in front of the school book depository building. Now the Secret Service have rules against that. The rules are that if the car is slowed down below 44 miles an hour, you must then protect it fully in other ways, such as not digressing and going around corners and all that, because when you slowed him around that corner, you opened up field of fire from three directions, behind him, to the side, and from in front, and of course he was killed right in that position that had been set up by the selection of that route. To this day, the gruesomeness of Kennedy's killing haunts those who are closest to the president. Riding a few feet from the limousine was Dallas police outrider Bobby Hargis. There's a, another motorcycle officer by the name of Buddy Brewer that came up to me and says, Bob, you have something on your lip. And he tucked his finger like that. And it was a piece of the president's brain and a piece of his skull bone that had hit me on the lip. The watery blood and stuff that came from his wound was had splattered my motorcycle and all over my uniform and my helmet and my face. And <clears throat> all of us felt real bad. Every single soul in the police department felt bad. And you could tell it by just looking at them. That's why I had all the bad dreams. One of the nightmares is uh, as we're turning off of Main Street onto Houston Street, I can see up at the school book depository, I can see the, something shiny in uh, one of the windows. And then the shine goes off and becomes a gun barrel. And I turn around on my motorcycle to try to tell the secret uh, service people that there's something up there and I scream and I yell and they don't hear me. And uh, <clears throat> I do this all the way until the president gets shot and no one hears me. In the ensuing chaos, Police officers at first acted independently, but within minutes their attention was focused on the Texas School Book Depository Building and its open windows. All the floors were systematically searched, but the first hard evidence was discovered in the southeast corner of the sixth floor by Dallas police detective Luke Mooney. I immediately saw the area and with some books had been stacked up and the window was half open. Now this window was not all the way open, it was only a half pane open, which is something of this nature, high up off the window sill. And I, I spotted the uh, spent cottages. They were lying approximately in this position. The first one was here, the second one was the, a foot or so from the other one. And then the third one was over in this approximate position, which the open window was like this, more so to speak, but it's an angle. Uh, I secured the area and let no one in to that particular spot where the sniper's nest was, where I had seen the spent shells. And someone <clears throat> brought the message up that uh, the president was DOA, was deceased. And at that time, you could have heard a pin drop. You talk about touching your heart, it did. And, uh, pardon me. <clears throat> we were standing there talking and trying to reach our composure. And uh, this wasn't brought out in the statement that uh, there was a book there. And uh, she looked over at it. And the uh, was open and why on this face of this book was about this size was a picture of Christ. And it says, Christ leads the way. Outside Parkland Hospital, grief overcame the waiting crowd as the president's death was confirmed. 
The first to break the news was Senator Ralph Yarbrough. I knew he was dead. I'd been around enough violence in my life to know he was a dead man. And the press came up and they asked me uh, what had happened. So I said, there's been a deed of horror and Exocabular has sunk beneath the waves. I thought that would tell them, in effect, what had happened without my saying he was dead. We made valiant uh, and unceasing efforts to resuscitate this man who was mortally wounded. And I think had we taken the opposite attack and said, oh, this man is dead, that even today people would be questioning and telling us stories about mortally wounded people who had been resuscitated when all hope was lost. So instead of taking that approach, we took the approach, let's save this man if we can, and we made what would be commendable, I think, even by today's standards, efforts to resuscitate him. State authorities wanted to do an autopsy, which is state law in the state of Texas, and uh, the federal people wanted to take it back to Washington, D.C. And there was a lot of pushing, shoving, cursing. They would pull, we would try to roll the casket out, and someone would grab it and try to roll it back towards the uh, trauma room. This went on for quite a while. It was push and shove type thing. Quite a bit of, uh, like I say, obscene language. I had to hold on to the cross on the casket because of the friction that, you know, where people's pulling it back and forth. And, and uh, you know, I, I was scared to death. I, you know, I, I was really frightened. I believe that if Dr. Rose had been allowed to perform the examination here, since his qualifications were impeccable, that much of the early confusion surrounding the wounds and the questions uh, as to the direction and number of shots could have been settled quickly under the capable forensic studies which Dr. Rose would undoubtedly have performed. But we didn't have the opportunity to examine President Kennedy here. At Parkland Hospital, the Secret Service had won the battle for the president's body. With unseemly haste, they illegally removed it from Dallas and flew it back to Andrews Air Force Base in Washington. The new president had been sworn in on the plane and now made his first address to the nation. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. But as Kennedy's coffin was unloaded into a hearse in full public view, it seems his body was surreptitiously being removed from the far side of Air Force One and taken away by helicopter. I ask for your help and God. Its most likely destination was Walter Reed Army Hospital for a covert examination of the president's wounds and the removal of his brain. This prevented a proper investigation of the fatal headshot at the official autopsy. Only a five minute flight from Walter Reed, the helicopter pad at Bethesda Naval Hospital, where the autopsy team awaited the arrival of Kennedy's body. Medical technician Paul O'Connor was there. I remember it being about eight o'clock in the evening that we heard helicopters, I heard helicopters. And it sound, sounded to me like there were two helicopters couldn't tell where they were coming from or where they went, but it sounded like they were landing. A few minutes later, the door burst open in the back of the hospital, and in came six or eight men carrying the casket. America's finest forensic pathologists were not appointed to perform the autopsy of the century. Instead, naval career men with meager experience of such work were chosen. As forensic pathologist, Dr. Cyril Wecht explains. Humes and Boswell, were in charge of hospital pathology at Bethesda, just like uh, hospital pathologists in civilian life. They had had no formal training or experience or practice in forensic pathology. It was incredible that Humes and Boswell should have been selected to perform this autopsy. Actually, these two doctors, Dr. Boswell and Dr. Humes, were became commanding officers of a particular school, which was the school that I was attending, and their jobs in those days it was more administrative <clears throat> than it was actually laying the hands on to, to people to do uh, autopsies and such. I'd never seen them do autopsies all the time that I was there. As a matter of fact, I never even saw them ever, ever come in the morgue. There were, we know, about 33 people officially logged in the autopsy room that night. 
We know that there was an admiral, there was a general, there were FBI and Secret Service people. And these uh, people, Humes and Boswell, were career military people, just a couple of years shy of retirement. They were not about to stand up and say uh, to uh, their superior officers, we're going to do it our way. No way would they say that. There were the kind of mysterious civilian people in civilian clothes were there. It seemed like they commanded a lot of uh, respect and attention. Sinister looking people that they would come up and look over my shoulder or look over Dr. Boswell's shoulder and run back and they'd have a little conference in the corner. And then all at once we said, there's nowhere comes down and says, stop what you're doing and go to the other procedure. And that's the way it was all night. And we just jumped back and forth, back and forth. There was no sm smooth flow of the procedure at all. So we see that Humes and Boswell were indeed controlled, and we know from their own records that they, Humes and Boswell, were not professionally competent and expert in the realm of forensic pathology. And that's how you got a botched, horribly inadequate, inept, in in inadequate superficial medical legal autopsy in the case of John F. Kennedy. But manipulation of the evidence did not end with the legal autopsy. The National Archives in Washington received a metal tray containing all the vital medical materials relating to the case, including the president's brain. An inventory check three years after the assassination revealed that these items had vanished. In that inventory of October 30th, 1966, that metal tray containing the brain and the kodachromes and the microscopic autopsy tissue slides are no longer listed. So somewhere between April of 65 and the end of October 66, these things were literally taken, illegally stolen, removed from the National Archives. And to this day, as we sit and talk, nobody in the United States government has ever accounted for these missing items. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what this would mean in a, in a routine murder case? I can tell you, as a forensic pathologist testifying in a courtroom, if I came in in a murder that you know, not many people cared about, and the other side was asking, uh, where is the brain, and did you examine it, and what did you find, and so on, and I said, well, I chose not to examine it. Where is it? Uh, can you examine it today, or our experts want to examine it? Well, I don't have any longer. It, uh, it was discarded, or so on. You know what would happen to that case, probably? The judge would throw it out of the courtroom. But in this case, the government hasn't been concerned, and my colleagues in forensic pathology were not concerned, and yet there's not one of them would ever tolerate that kind of aberrant, unacceptable, unethical, immoral, and illegal procedure or policy in his own office. Not one of them. But in this case, it just rolls off their back, along with the acceptance of the single bullet theory and all the other things. In the confusion following the assassination, the police arrested a dozen suspects in and around Dealey Plaza. All were later released. Three of those taken into custody were discovered in the marshalling yards close to the book depository, hiding in a railroad boxcar which was about to leave the area. No official record exists of who they were or what they were doing, yet their arrest was widely photographed by the press. They have become known as the Three Tramps. It was determined in uh, late 1970s and early 1980s that one of the Three Tramps, the taller of the, of the three, bore a striking resemblance to a man by the name of Charles V. Harrelson, who was convicted of killing a federal judge in San, San Antonio, Texas, a man who uh, claims to have killed at least five people previously, has been tried for some of those, and a man who has all of the right connections. Charles Harrelson is one of America's most notorious criminals. He's currently serving a life sentence for murder in a maximum security jail. On November 22nd, 1963, I was with a friend at 12.30 in the afternoon having lunch at a restaurant in Houston, Texas. It wouldn't be the first time I've been accused of being somewhere I wasn't, and I probably won't be the last. But no, I, I did not kill John Kennedy. He, uh, he's connected to organized crime figures, the Dallas Underworld, uh, Santos Traficante, uh, Carlos Marcello, uh, 
R.D. Matthews considered the strong-armed man in Dallas in 1963, and Ruby claimed that he was his best friend. So uh, you have all of these connections, and uh, though they don't say specifically, hey, Charles Harrelson is guilty of participating in the murder of the President Kennedy, but there is significant evidence that would make, I think, any investigator want to look at Mr. Harrelson very, very closely. Um, that is a photograph of one of three so-called tramps uh, who were apprehended and then mysteriously disappeared on the day of the Kennedy assassination. And uh, the fellow was, I'm told, at one time positive, positively identified as myself, uh, which is ludicrous if you look at the man. Um, I was 25 the day Kennedy was assassinated, and I would say that gentleman is probably in his mid to late 30s at the very least. But uh, the facial structures um, isn't even close. Mr. Harrelson's photograph was given along with the tall tramp photographs to forensic anthropologists, two independent uh, bodies or people. And uh, they came back with a report that there was a 90 to 95 percent probability that the photograph of the tall tramp arrested in connection with the president's killing and Charles V. Harrelson arrested for the death of a federal judge were one and the same. Now that's amazing, isn't it? I would say the um Uh, that is closer, much closer, but uh, I'm sure that uh, here again, the person is probably in his 30s, and the brow ridge isn't isn't the same here, but it is, it does look very, it looks a lot more like me, I would say, this view than does the other. Are they the same person? Yeah. Big Bird? Yes. It's amazing. But, uh, no, I I don't know the gentleman and I uh, never did know. Everyone who was involved in that thing has been eliminated. Had I been involved in it, I would have been killed. Had I been approached to be involved in it, I would have laughed. Because it's obviously a case of emulation. You're going to destroy yourself by doing something like that because the agency involved in carrying out this assassination cannot have someone with first-hand information regarding the assassination. No way. The country would destruct if that came forth. Also kept under wraps and not investigated was the criminal underworld of strip club owner Jack Ruby, Oswald's executioner. Vital areas of his illicit operations in Dallas, New Orleans, and Cuba went unexplored by the Warren Commission. But Ruby's twilight world held many of the secrets behind the assassination. At Parkland Hospital, minutes after the tragedy, one member of the press corps who knew Jack Ruby well was to have an extraordinary encounter, reporter Seth Cantor. Just after I entered, there was a group of uh, nurses and doctors uh, standing around with a lot of concern, and Jack Ruby came up to me. He said something to the effect that, isn't this just terrible? And uh, he, looked, he looked as if he was extremely distressed. I shook hands with him, and uh, uh, I had known him previously. And uh, Ruby asked me what I thought about his closing his places of business uh, for a day or two out of concern for what had happened. And I told him I thought that was a good idea and to please excuse me, I had to go on. I guess that encounter with Ruby took maybe 25, 30 seconds. It was very clear to me who I had talked to and uh, who I had uh, called by name and who had called me by name and who I had shaken hands with and everything. But when the Warren Commission report came out, they said that uh, probably under the stress of, of everything that was going on, 
that I, uh, I most likely was confused and that I talked to Ruby at the police station several hours later. Ruby denied he'd been at Parkland and the Warren Commission believed him rather than Seth Cantor. I was dismayed when I picked up my copy of the Warren Commission report and discovered uh, what, what they had decided about my testimony. And um, among other things, I immediately began to wonder, you know, who else they had talked to, who they chose not to believe, and why. A pristine bullet, which the commission was to allege had wounded both Kennedy and Connolly, magically appeared on a stretcher at Parkland. Jack Ruby's coincidental appearance inside the hospital was not the only fact the commissioners chose to ignore. They certainly didn't want to go into the fact that uh, members of the American, of the United States underworld were dealing with the CIA uh, in connection with the uh, plans to get rid of Castro. Lyndon Johnson was very anxious for the Warren Commission to complete its work, to button things up and get out a report. And they were not anxious at all to open up areas of doubt or areas which needed further investigation. And one of those areas was the Jack Ruby business. Ruby claimed he acted on impulse when he shot Oswald. His real motives were never explored. The Warren Commission believed everything Jack Ruby chose to tell them, including how he penetrated the basement security of Dallas Police Headquarters in order to kill Oswald. I don't believe that Ruby entered the uh, basement of the Dallas police station by way of the ramp from Main Street, which is the fiction that uh, came about not long after he was arrested for killing Oswald. The policeman on duty at the top of the ramp was given a, uh, a lie detector test, and he insisted that Ruby did not pass him at any time, and the lie detector test given by the police department uh, bore that out. Uh, Jack Ruby did not come down that ramp. Uh, I'll go to my grave saying he didn't come down that ramp. If anybody could have ever proved to me beyond a reasonable doubt that he came down that ramp, I feel that I was man enough to, to admit that, yes, maybe I made a mistake or was negligent in some area. But no, nobody's ever proved that to me, and I'll go to my grave saying that man did not come down that ramp. Only four minutes before he gunned down Oswald in the basement, Ruby had been at the Western Union office on Main Street, cabling money to one of his strippers. According to the commission account, he then walked down the street and simply slipped down the basement ramp unnoticed by Officer Vaughan, a view denied by researcher Larry Harris. Well, clearly, Jack Ruby did not enter the basement via the Main Street ramp, as the Warren Commission concluded. And indeed, when Congress reopened the investigation in the late 1970s, they concluded he did not come down the ramp, and they cited eight witnesses who stated that Ruby did not come down the ramp, and, and several of these witnesses knew Ruby personally. They, the Congressional Committee concluded that Ruby most likely used an obscure entrance into the building that was located in the alleyway behind me. There, he would have proceeded into the lobby uh, to an unlocked door that led directly into the basement. He would have gone down that stairwell and actually entered into the parking garage area of the basement seated toward the railing, up through the railing and into the spot where he was standing when he lurched forward to shoot Oswald. Clearly it, it looked better for the department to say that Vaughn had accidentally let Ruby into the basement while his back was turned rather than admit that a key area within the garage had been left completely unguarded, permitting Jack Ruby unchallenged access to the spot where he killed Oswald. Larry's conclusions are supported by the immediate comments of several police officers recorded by live TV cameras just after the shooting. And this man came from behind, the, behind this camera or from this corner and just dove out of, out of the crowd. He came from behind that car, that green car there. He jumped up over the rail. Yeah. Patrick Dean was the head of security in the basement and was aware very quickly of the predicament he was in. As Ruby was being subdued, Dean remarked to Ruby, Jack, 
goddamn, you've got me in one hell of a fix. So Dean was immediately aware of his predicament and, of course, began immediately maneuvering to put the best possible light on the situation. There was about 15 to 20 men that had searched this place prior to uh, 30 minutes, uh, in fact, searched it twice, about an hour before and then 30 minutes before. The late Patrick Dean was adamant that the only way Ruby could have gained access to the basement was via the Main Street ramp. I'm positive that, that that door leading from the city hall proper into the basement was locked by the maintenance man in my presence that day on, on, the, on the inside of the basement side. And I also had two men stationed at that door. But I am positive that that, that door was locked. Now, that, that door possibly could have been opened by someone from the other side. However, no one did come through there because, as I say, two men were stationed there as guards for that particular door that led from the city hall proper to the basement. Two reserve officers who'd been stationed there earlier that morning had been reassigned to points outside the building directing traffic so that this left an area of vulnerability from the stairwell to the point near the railing where Ruby shot Oswald. The police blundered with Oswald's murder but the security of the president had been a secret service responsibility. The Dallas police had been powerless to prevent the assassination. They were also powerless in carrying out a proper investigation afterwards. We have the evidence, they claim, of three bullets being fired at the president, one hitting uh, the governor, Connolly. Well, policemen would take those hard bits of evidence and begin to put this thing together and first of all would show that they could not have done the damage they did, the lethal damage they did with only three bullets. If you come to this conclusion and you do it accurately by physical evidence, you throw the entire Warren Commission report out. The policemen working on the street are accustomed to solving murders and they would go right ahead of it with it unless somebody stopped them. So somebody stopped them, there's your cover up. The FBI in Washington had at first given their full cooperation to the Dallas police. Their field agent in Dallas, in charge of the Oswald file prior to the assassination, was James Hosty. He was directed to help the police in their initial interrogation of Oswald. But within hours, these orders were changed. I was approached by one of the senior agents from the uh, counterintelligence squad and was told that there were now new orders and I was not to talk to Oswald anymore and I was not to cooperate with the police department in any manner uh, concerning Oswald's background. I have since determined that those orders came directly from Assistant Director William Sullivan, who was in charge of the Foreign Counterintelligence Squad. He was also the person who had direct liaison with the National Security Council. The National Security Council is the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, and the Secretary of Defense. Uh, that's about as high as you can get. Hosty's Washington superiors knew much more about Oswald than they were willing to divulge. Consequently, his surveillance of Oswald had also been based on incomplete information. I was not aware of the fact that President Kennedy, through the CIA, was attempting to overthrow Castro and that Fidel Castro had threatened President Kennedy. Had I known this, I would have immediately been concerned about Lee Oswald because we knew he was pro-Castro. Had I known this, then uh, we could have put a whole different light on the situation. It was here in Neely Street that Hosty first attempted to contact the Oswalds in March 1963. His visit was routine because of their links with Russia. But they had moved on. Later in the year, Hosty spoke to Marina alone, prompting an angry note from Oswald, hand-delivered to the FBI three weeks before the assassination. The, the note which I subsequently determined was from Lee Oswald was unsigned. It was quite short. It just said, uh, if you want to talk to me, uh, come talk to me. Don't bother my wife. I don't want you talking to her without my being there. If you don't uh, cease and desist on this, I will take this up with the proper authorities or words to that effect. I had uh, thought it was somebody else at first and just uh, put it into my file drawer until I had a chance to look into it further. Late on the afternoon of... Uh, November 24th, the day Oswald was killed, 
uh, I, I was told by Supervisor Ken Howe to go to the office of Gordon Shanklin, the agent in charge of the Dallas office. He wanted to see me. I was called in there, and Gordon Shanklin reached down into one of his uh, uh, desk drawers and took out the note and handed it to me and said, here, I don't want to ever see this again. He said, Oswald is dead now. There can't be any trial. Now, this was the reason why it was legal to uh, get rid of this uh, note at this time, since there was no trial, and President Johnson was adamantly opposed to any hearings. The uh, FBI then felt it was all right to dispose of uh, this note. I was then, I then tried to, to, tried to tear it up and throw it in the wastebasket. Gordon Shanklin said, don't get it out of here. I don't want to ever see it again. So I then took it out, and I was going to burn it, but that would have been a little bit messy, so I thought it would be much easier to flush it down the toilet, and that would get rid of it permanently. It wasn't until a week later that uh, President Johnson gave in to uh, congressional pressure and called the Warren Commission together. Of course, by this time, uh, the FBI and probably the CIA and uh, the Navy Department and the State Department had uh, suppressed a lot of different things, and this was one of probably many of them. Miami, Florida was the city visited by President Kennedy four days before his death in Dallas. It was also the unlikely location for a bizarre meeting 13 days before the assassination in which details of the plot to kill Kennedy were set out with stunning accuracy. A Miami police informant secretly taped a conversation with a visiting right-wing activist in his seedy downtown apartment. It is broadcast here for the first time. I don't know, Kennedy's coming here, I think, on the 18th or something like that, to make some kind of speech. I think it's the 18th he's supposed to be here to make a speech. And I don't even know what it's about. If you can bet you about now, you're going to have a lot to say about the Cuban, because there's so many of them here. Willie Somerset, a union organizer with extensive right-wing political ties, was the Miami police informant. Joseph Miltier was the wealthy, rabble-rousing racist from Quitman, Georgia. In charge of the surveillance operation was Miami detective Everett Kay. Well, we had to set up the tape recorder in Somerset's apartment in order to, uh, to make the recording where he met with, uh, with this other uh, man, uh, Miltier. In order to do so, uh, it was a very large tape recorder that was made especially for an, uh, intelligence work, weighing approximately 40 pounds. I carried it to the third floor of his apartment, uh, placed it in a closet, and then ran the microphone around the baseboard in the kitchen, and the microphone was uh, hidden by, by the chairs where Miltier and uh, Somerset were to have their meeting. conversation came up that this man wanted to know how many people that President Kennedy had that was his look-alike that went with him and our informant wanted to know why and he said well there was plans to assassinate him. The further conversation on the tape revealed that uh, the assassination was to take place uh, from an office building with a high-powered rifle. There is no particular city mentioned, uh, 
or was there any particular person mentioned that was to do the assassination? The tape was made on uh, November the 9th, and John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy, was due in Miami on the 18th of November, 1963. So the close proximity of the tape being made and his visit uh, made quite a few changes in the security. They changed the motorcade, and uh, I believe that he was helicoptered, and rather than have a motorcade, uh, additional men were um, secured. Uh, uh, everyone was made aware that uh, that, that uh, there may be a problem, so there was a drastic change in the procedures. It wasn't as accessible in this city as he might have been in in the past. Boy, if that Kennedy is getting shot, we gotta know where we at. Yeah, but you know, boy, that would be a real shame to do that. And they wouldn't leave any stone unturned there. Oh, no way. Oh, hell no. And, uh, they'll, they'll pick up somebody for the hour after. And they might get what happened. Well, just to do that. So I just throw the public off. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, somebody's going to have to go to jail if he gets yeah. Miltier later boasted to Somerset that he went to witness the assassination in Dallas. The question was, was Joseph Miltier in Dealey Plaza? Was he in Dallas to witness the execution of the president? And if so, was he photographed? I looked at some of the photographs of the crowd, combed the photographs of the crowds in Dealey Plaza around Houston Street and Elm Street. And I did find in several photographs of one spot on Houston Street, a white-haired man who looked amazingly like Joseph Miltier. In my opinion, given the measurements of the ears, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, I'm convinced that the man in the photographs is Joseph Miltier. We know that he made a phone call from Dallas to Willie Somerset, the informant, that day saying that President Kennedy would never again return to Miami. Therefore, it is likely that he was there. And given the nature of this and the way Miltier felt about the president, it seemed very likely that he would indeed be in Dallas. We thought we did a good job and was very grateful the fact that it did not happen in Miami. It could have very well happened in, in Miami, um, as it did in Dallas. So it, it touched it touched each of us uh, very, very closely, particularly myself, as hearing the words that they were going to assassinate President Kennedy. Why the hell are you doing the best way we can get it? Coming off this building, uh, with a high mark in front of us. And they're going to really try to kill it. Uh, it Miltier was interviewed by the FBI and then released. He perished in a mysterious house fire a few years later. The Warren Commission ignored the Miami connection and a further opportunity to determine the truth. It is important to all of us to find out what really happened to President Kennedy. Because what happened to him could happen to anybody else. If a conspiracy can kill the President of the United States, who among us is safe? The people who know something, why don't they just bring it out and tell the truth? Why lie about something? Somebody knows that they're lying. I know they're lying. Why? If they lied to us, how much are they lying to us in other areas? And if they're lying to us, can they do it again and again and again? And if so, this is not a democracy. This is a, a hierarchy, a government or a people ran by certain powerful individuals who have the ability to dispose of anyone who's not going along the party line, so to speak. Not a whole lot different from what I was taught uh, occurred in the USSR all these many years. The truth is the most important thing.